Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm your host, Ali, the manager at Enlightens Education. AP exams take place in May each year, and students must prepare and organize the school year's worth of material into a manageable study schedule before the exams. Good AP test scores can help the students in the college admissions process and may even earn you college credits. If you don't know how to study for AP exams, today's webinar is a guide for you. Let's welcome the speaker, our academic advisor and tutor, Harry, to give us an in-depth analysis of how to get five on AP exams. Before we start the webinar, uh, please let me introduce a little bit about Enlightens and what we do. We are a group of educators who have many years of experience in college admissions consulting and working with families in the Bay Area and beyond. Enlightens Education offers personalized a college planning services and strengths-based mentoring approach to identify each student's character, interests, strengths, opportunities, and discover a unique education path to realize their long-term goals. This includes guiding families through the confusing college applications process, course selection, extracurricular activities, summer planning, and test prep. Our offices in Cupertino and Pleasanton are home to our full-time consultants and support staffs with an average of eight years of experience. Our years of teamwork also let us offer stability and a high level of synergy. There are two parts of tonight's webinar. First part is Henry's presentation and second part is Q&A. All right, let me give the stage to Henry and get started. All right, thank you, Ali. Okay, so I'm going to be your speaker tonight. So um, we will be talking about the AP exams, but first, um, a little bit about my background. So I actually um, grew up in the United States and I went to basically Gunn High School, which is a very competitive high school in the South Bay. After graduating from high school, I went to UC San Diego and majored in biology at Roosevelt College. Roosevelt College has really, really, really high writing requirements. So definitely be careful if you are actually choosing to apply to UC San Diego. As for my professional background, I've been working as a tutor and instructor for um, over a decade at this point. And I cover many, many different subjects, including AP Biology, AP Chemistry, um, AB and BC Calculus, AP Stats. Um, so generally basically the math and sciences. On top of that, I also do prep students for the SAT math section and also ACT math and science. My students are generally mostly in, in the South Bay and also in the East Bay from uh, many of the local high schools. So I'm sure um, maybe some of your children are actually attending these high schools now. In addition, I occasionally get students that are uh, based in schools that are not in the Bay Area. So I have, for example, a couple of students that have been in like the Los Angeles area as well. Okay, so tonight we're actually going to talk a few things, a few different um, areas that are related to the AP exams. So first is what is the role of the AP examinations in college admissions? A kind of a comparison between the AP exams from last year versus this year. And then we'll take a look at some of the more popular AP subjects. And then we will actually um, to share some tips and some ideas on how to do well on the AP exams. Okay. So what is the point of the AP exams? So first, um, there are actually two slightly different things that we have to look at. One is the idea of the AP class versus the AP exam. AP class is a class that students can um, choose to take. Um, typically, it's going to be a year-long course with the exception of a few that are actually a single semester. So AP Gov and economics are actually semester courses, while the others are a full year course. So that's AP classes. The AP exam is typically an exam that's taken in May, although this year due to the pandemic, College Board has done some, let's say interesting things about the exam. And so we'll actually get into that detail a little bit later. Typically it's going to be uh, done in May, at the beginning of May, about two weeks before students take their finals. So that makes May a very, very, very busy month for a lot of students. Now, the class actually is generally going to be more helpful in terms of GPA. And the reason for this is because an A in an AP class is worth five on the GPA scale. So normally, um, if we look at like, normally if it's a non-AP non honors class, the GPA basically goes like an A is equal to four, a B is equal to three, a C is equal to two. But for an AP and honors class, you will actually get a GPA bump. That is, you will get five for A, four for B, three for C, and so on. That's important for your weighted GPA. Now, the exam score, however, is like the AP exam is more important in terms of like determining the college credit because um, good scores on AP exams is worth college credit. And in some cases that can shave off some time in terms of um, studying in college. Here we have actually an example of a, um, the admit data 
for a um, UC, I believe this one is for UC Berkeley. And if we take a look at the GPA requirements, that is the GPA for the middle, basically 50%. So that means students that get admitted to UC Berkeley that are between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, they have a high school GPA of 4.13 to 4.3. So that GPA is because of the fact that students are generally taking AP classes and those AP classes will help bump their GPA up. The exam itself serves a couple of other purposes as well. One is that it demonstrates a student's ability to understand subject material, that is their proficiency in a subject area. Now, because College Board has actually recently removed the SAT subject test, this has made the AP exams a little bit more important in that regards because now there is no, aside from your grades, which can be affected by instructor opinion, that is, it's not as objective, the AP exams would serve as a more objective measure of what have the students actually learned. In addition, because AP classes uh, and doing well on the AP exams shows to colleges that students are ready to perform at a college level. That is, they are able to basically study effectively and they are ready for actual college. Now, Depending on the AP uh, exam and depending on the college or university, a good AP score, typically looking at a score of a four or a five, is typically going to be worth some college credit and oftentimes will also fulfill prerequisite requirements. This means that the student can actually skip some of the classes that they would, if they had not taken the AP exam, they would actually have to take. And that again can actually shave off some time spent in college. Now, there are many different AP exams, and so therefore students uh, usually have, usually I think right now it's around time when students are actually doing course selections. So sometimes it can be kind of challenging to decide, okay, what AP classes do I want to take? So for math, we actually have three different levels. So our three actually different types of AP, AP classes. So we have AB calculus is gonna cover basically derivatives and integrals. We have BC calculus, which basically covers all the AB material in first semester, and then covers miscellaneous topics in second semester. AP statistics, um, which covers probability and statistics. And then for the sciences, we have biology, chemistry, physics, and physics is actually divided into four different classes. We'll actually go into a little bit more detail of what each of those classes will entail um, later on. We have computer science, uh, computer science principles, which is kind of like an intro to computer science. And it's more kind of more on the theory side and less about um, actual coding, which is actually covered in um, AP computer science A. Um, capstone courses typically are covered at, are usually senior level classes, so uh, junior and senior level classes, which includes AP research and AP seminar. Um, okay, and then for the social sciences, we have AP human geography, uh, macro and microeconomics, psychology, and then for English, we have AP uh, Lang and AP Lit, both very demanding in terms of the reading and the writing requirements. We also have history courses, so um, comparative government, European history, U US government and politics, United States history, and also AP world history. Typically, um, the AP US uh, government and econ are usually taken as senior level classes since both of those are both semester classes. So you would do one semester of um, U US government and then another semester of economics. Okay, and then we have the foreign languages, foreign languages and art. So. Um, AP Chinese, French, German, Italian, um, Latin, Japanese, Spanish language and Spanish literature. And then for art, we have art history, music theory, uh, studio art 2D design, studio art 3D design, and also studio art drawing. Okay, so this year is pretty unique in terms of the AP exams. I'm kind of a little bit baffled as to why College Board decided to do it this way. But let's first take a look at last year where the pandemic just started. And so during that time, College Board was kind of a mess in terms of trying to figure out, okay, how are we gonna administer AP exams in the middle of a pandemic? So last year in the 2020 AP exams, that was really fun, I guess, very challenging to actually try and prep for the exams because last year, the, the exam was a 45 minute free response exam. Now, normally an AP exam takes three hours. So they actually completely axed the multiple choice and then they also removed some topics. So like usually usually AP prep time is usually around March and April. So it was a bit of a scramble last year in terms of making sure that we actually covered everything that was gonna be covered on the exam and not spend too much time on the stuff that was not gonna be covered on the exams. The input choices were a little bit different because the students were taking the exam from home. So students could either type their responses on a computer or they could handwrite their responses and then take a picture of it and then send it in. Another complexity was the fact that College Board basically mandated one test date and one test time per test across the entire world. 
So for example, some of my students are actually not in the United States. They might be actually in um, like, for example, China or Japan. And so for them, they were basically taking the AP exam last year in the middle of the night, local time. And that was extremely difficult and extremely challenging for those students. This year is a little bit different. The exam is now full length. So that's gonna be a full three hours of exams with both free response component and also a multiple choice component. And unlike last year where some of the topics were moved, this year, all the topics are actually covered on the exam. It's a, quite a bit more challenging compared to last year, but it's the next part that basically drives me a little bit nuts as an instructor, because instead of having just one test date, they now have three separate test dates. The idea behind this is to, of course, maintain maximum amount of flexibility, but the devil is all in the details. So the exam can be either digital or paper and pencil, um, either taken at school or at home. And this is dependent on what type of exam. Okay, now, unfortunately for students, the offered test dates depends 100% on the school. It does not actually, it does not give students any opportunity to have any input on which test dates they can actually take. Now, the test dates are, okay, so three separate test dates. So test date, the first round of testing will be administration one, and that is gonna occur during the more traditional AP exam season, which is the beginning of May. So May uh, three through seven, 10 through 12, 14 and 17. Now, administration one is completely at school. It is a full length exam and it is paper and pencil only. The exception to that, of course, would be the foreign language exams, which are going to be digital, but they must be taken at school and they cannot be taken from home. Round two is administration two, and that is May 18th through 28th. And this is going to be a bit of a mix in terms of which exams are going to be paper and pencil only and which exams are going to be digital. It's gonna be about half and half. So a lot of the exams will be paper and pencil, and then some of them will be digital at school or at home. There is a minor issue with the second administration is that typically the end of May is typically final season for students. And so there is a decent likelihood that the AP exams will overlap with student finals. And that is definitely not a good place for students to be. For administration three, this is actually June 1st to the 11th. And most of these subjects can be done digitally from home or at school. It also does cut into the students summer break a little bit. But frankly, since students are, are basically at home due to the pandemic, uh, it's in some ways it kind of feels like they're still, still on break. Okay, um, let's see, the exam formats. So in administrations one and two, calculus, both A, B, and B, C, chemistry, physics, and statistics are all pencil and paper. And the rationale for this I find is a little bit specious is that um, instructors have basically told College Board that they actually prefer pen paper and pencil exam rather than digital for ease of actually inputting in student answers, which it's all about your design. The design of the user interface is going to make it easier or worse for the end user to actually input information. Now, the language exams, music theory, have no digital version. You cannot actually take those exams from home. They must be taken at school only. Now, there are quite a few dates that students need to pay attention to because that is when College Board will either A, release information or will have test dates. So the first, the first major date has already actually passed. That was a few days ago, which was on March 2nd, a digital testing update where the College Board will release more information about the digital testing application. Starting April 8th, the digital testing application will be available. So this is something that students must install before the test date and have it set up to go. Um, so definitely, definitely do not wait until the last minute to actually uh, get that set up. Round one for the AP exams will start uh, May 3rd, and that will run through basically the 17th. And th these exams are only at school. During the months of May and June, the students need to make sure that they have the um, digital testing application set up and ready to go. So, um, and so that will be during the months of May and June. Round two will basically begin May 18th through the 28th. And some of the APs actually do have portfolios or performance tasks that need to be submitted. So the deadlines for those submissions are basically May 20th. And then the last round of AP exams, which will be, uh, will be June 1st through 11th. So, after reading through all the College Board material, here are some suggestions that students should consider um, in terms of the AP exams. So one is, as I've actually already told many of my students, you need to make sure you double and triple check with your school to make sure that they will actually in fact be offering the exam 
during your preferred time slot. If they're not, then you have a decision to make. So for example, if your school only offers, for example, administration one, then you do not have a choice of taking it digitally at all. In fact, for one of my students, she has decided actually not to take the AP exams because she is worried about actually catching COVID. And she, even though she does really wants to take the exam, she can't do it because she actually has a medical condition. And that would make it very risky for her. If the school actually offers administration two, students need to check with their instructors to make sure that their AP exam does not overlap with their second semester finals. And like I said before, typically second semester finals are usually in, at, in the end of May, shortly before students leave for uh, a summer break. The paper and pencil exams and the digital exams do have a little bit of difference in terms of format. So it is actually important to review the College Report website and making, making sure that you have a handle on what are the differences in terms of the AP exam format. Uh, in addition, because of the fact that there are so many test dates, it's very important that students keep an eye on which exams are they taking, what dates are they taking, and the format of the exam. Is it going to be a digital exam? Is it going to be go to school for a paper and pencil exam? Um, after April 8th, students need to make sure that the digital exam application is properly set up. Do not, I know students have a tendency to wait until the last minute. Please do not wait until the last minute to actually get the application set up because technical issues, you want those resolved far in advance before you actually have to actually utilize it. In addition, College Board will release some practice exams in the digital format. So that is definitely worth doing so that you understand how the digital format is going to be a little bit different. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're actually going to take a look at a number of very popular AP subjects that usually a lot of students will take. We'll go into a brief discussion of the um, what is actually covered in each of these classes and topics that actually show up on the exam, along with a breakdown of the score distribution for the last year. This would be um, the 2020 exam uh, score distribution. So um, I actually put A, B, and B, C calculus together because there is considerable overlap in terms of the material for the two courses. So A, B calculus basically covers limits and continuity, uh, differentiation, applications of differentiation, integration, differential equations, and applications of integration. Now, typically for an AB class, the first semester is gonna be very heavy on differentiation and they usually end first semester with like a little bit of introduction on inter integration. Now, in contrast, the BC class will basically cover everything that AB covers in the first semester. And then in second semester, they will cover additional topics including parametric equations, polar coordinates, vector valued functions, and infinite sequences and series. Now, Important things that students need to keep in mind when taking the calculus exams. It is absolutely important that students show all their work, that the work basically demonstrates their thought process. And that was usually what the grader wants to see. They want to understand how are you solving the problem? How are you getting your answer? It is oftentimes very important to make sure that you properly justify um, using an appropriate mathematical reason why your answer is the answer. So for example, if you're doing this, uh, if you're doing a derivative test, for example, just showing a number line is not enough. Oftentimes you will need to have a little bit more explanation that you are actually utilizing the second derivative test, for example. Just like for statistics, don't just use calculator syntax. It's not very clear in terms of what you're trying to say. It's, um, and so therefore it's better to basically use the proper notation. Oftentimes, uh, students sometimes may be a little bit careless in terms of reading what the question is asking. And so they may only answer part of the question. For example, they might provide a numeric answer without a justification. And like all AP exams, it's very important to work through previous AP exam questions because that helps you get a sense of the type of questions that might be asked and kind of the style. When you've worked through enough AP exams, you do get a sense of this is going to show up on the AP exam. So for example, like for BC calculus, one thing, one topic that almost always shows up on the free response is something related to Taylor's sequence, uh, Taylor's series. And so understanding Taylor series is definitely crucial for a BC calculus student. And if, because that will basically get you one free response question for sure. Now the score distributions for a B B C calculus is a little bit, I guess, different between the two. So AB calculus, around 20% um, of students get fives in contrast to the almost 45% for last year for BC calculus. For AB, about 21% fours and about for BC is about 18%. The difference in the score distribution is because the caliber of students that you're seeing in the two classes is very different. Okay, 
Typically, students that are uh, deciding on BC calculus are typically very strong, uh, very strong mathematically. So typically, these are some of the strongest students at the high school level. There are, of course, a handful of students that actually do go beyond um, BC calculus. For example, they might take BC calculus uh, junior year, and then they will be taking multivariable as a senior, probably at a local community college. Although there are some schools that offer multivariable as a high school class. I have worked with a lot of calculus students over the, over the years. And so here are some examples of students that I have worked with. So um, for, let's see. So the first case study that I'm analyzing right now is going to be in a classroom setting. So basically a large class with 10 students. All the students in that class got either a four or a five on the AB calculus exam. So this was a intensive 30 hour class and it's pretty hard to actually get through everything in 30 hours, but and we managed to get through everything. On top of actually discussing all the different topics, working through practice problems, I also had the students work through many of the FRQ questions. And the reason why I spent more time on FRQ is simply because students tend to have a little bit more difficulty with FRQ over multiple choice, especially the justification aspect. And you're gonna hear that a lot, like across the board for the math and sciences. Justification is crucial in terms of getting that, you know, one or, one or two points per question. Um, on top of that, I have also worked with students in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So one of my BC calculus students was actually in Los Angeles. This was, I think, two, three years ago. So we were actually working together um, online since we can't, we couldn't meet in person. Very easy, very, very easy, very fun student to work with. And he ended up getting a five on the BC calc exam. And then um, one of my students that I worked with in person a few years back. So the previous year he had actually done AB calculus. And so then the following year, he was actually taking AP statistics at his high school and also wanted to take the BC exam. So I only basically taught him the material that is in second semester BC only and the rest of the AB material he basically reviewed himself, took the AP exam for BC and got a five. Okay, AP statistics. AP statistics is very heavy on probability, um, probability and statistics. So we will also, um, cover a number of additional topics, including the analysis of one variable and two variable data, how to collect data. Um, a proper choice of sampling method is crucial so that you actually have data that is reflective of the population. And so if your um, data collection method is poor, your sample is not gonna be representative. And so therefore you will not be able to draw good conclusions. And the class covers probability, random variables and probability distributions, and also sampling distributions. In addition, major topics in the second semester include basically confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. And in fact, one of my students actually right now, we're actually going through that material together. I think we're going to go through that again on Tuesday. Inference for categorical data of proportions, means, uh, chi-squared, and also slopes. So there's a lot going on in AP stats. AP statistics is considered one of the easier APs, but at the same time, it is very, very nitpicky in terms of formatting. So it's really, really important to understand the language that is expected for this AP exam. Like for the calculus exam, it is important that students show all the work. Again, the grader does want to understand how you're thinking through the material. Unlike calculus where the justifications might not, there is much more in terms of justifications that are needed for statistics. The AP statistics exam is much more conceptual in nature. And the reason for this is because the AP statistics is very, it's very easy to do many of the operations with the calculator, unlike um, AB and BC, where you do not, it's not as heavy, heavily reliant on the calculator. Now for statistics, you can use calculator syntax, but it is important to label the variables that you're inputting. Do not just basically scribble down, okay, binomials, uh, CDF, and then four numbers. That is not what they are looking for. They do want to see that you understand the function that you're using on the calculator. It is important to pay attention to the formatting and the language that is utilized for the test. So an example of this actually comes with hypothesis testing, which ends up being an issue for AP bio students. And that kind of drives me a little bit nuts since I teach both AP statistics and AP bio. So for hypothesis testing in AP statistics, the proper like language that is used for um, either rejecting or failing to reject, that is if, if your statistical test um, basically shows that the null hypothesis may be false, then you usually say you reject the null hypothesis. If on the other hand, you do not have evidence to suggest that the null hypothesis is false, you use the term fail to reject rather than accept. And that is because statistics does require a little bit of wiggle room in terms of actually discussing um, your results. 
like the other exams, it's very important that students do get practice working through previous AP exam questions, because again, it's important to get a sense of what is going to be asked and how to actually format your answers so that you can earn the maximum number of points. Okay, for statistics, five is 16.2% last year and four is 20.7%, so reasonably high. Typically um, for AP exams, if it's under 10%, it's usually considered pretty hard. Although I think this was like, what, seven, eight years ago? I think AP bio was really bad at about 5% 5 fives. And that was definitely very, very challenging. So some case studies. Uh, this is actually the same student as the BC calculus student that I worked with. He was in L he was at, in an LA school. And so we basically just met online a few years back and we basically just went through the material and he got a five on the AP exam. And then, one of, my, uh, one of my students that I worked with in person went to Palto High School. Very nice girl, but a little bit low in terms of self-confidence, even though she was academically very strong. So I covered many subjects with her over the course of four years. ACT, analysis honors. Analysis honors at Palto is not too bad. Um, it was chemistry, even a little bit of physics, also statistics, 36 on the ACT, five on the AP exam. And she, I felt like she actually did gain more confidence as we worked together over the years. AP chemistry, one of the three big sciences. Generally, the science exams tend to be a little bit harder and that's simply because there's so much material that needs to be covered. So for AP chemistry, this kind of follows up on the uh, chem honors class, typically at a local high school. So it's gonna cover a lot of the same topics in significantly more depth. For example, uh, in AP chemistry, we will cover atomic structures and properties, molecular and ionic compound structure and properties, intermolecular forces and properties, chemical reactions, kinetics, thermodynamics, equilibrium, acid base, and application of thermodynamics. So right now we're, I think right now, some of my students are actually doing acid base stuff, which kind of neatly follows up after equilibrium. So understanding equilibrium is crucial for acid base understanding. Okay. Um, so the sciences, justification, 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 so important. Typically the AP exam questions are multiple parts. So it is important that students actually carefully read and understand uh, all parts of the question so that they don't lose points unnecessarily for misreading what the question is asking. Answer the question in as specific a manner as possible. Um, oftentimes, like I, like I said, I'm, I'm going to emphasize this a lot. Explanation and justification is key. And it's oftentimes, if your explanation is poor or the justification is not good, then you don't earn the points. One central thing to keep in mind for students that are doing AP Chemistry include understanding how periodic trends work and the justification. So the periodic trends are actually patterns on the periodic table across the elements. And the justifications almost always boil down to either effective nuclear charge which is a measure of um, the attractive force on the electrons by the proton and the nucleus versus the electron shielding, which is looking at the layers of electrons that basically reduce the effect of nuclear charge on the electrons in the outermost shell. On top of that, it's also important that students understand forces, specifically, for example, the difference between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. So intramolecular forces are forces between basic atoms that form up a molecule or a formula unit, if we're talking ionic compound. And intermolecular forces is forces between molecules. So much weaker in comparison to intramolecular forces. One of the things that probably drives me a little bit nuts when it comes to the sciences is definitely sig figs. Because even though sig figs are, is not a very difficult concept to understand, students invariably have issues with sig figs. And typically, you have to be really careful with sig figs. It's usually the last thing you do when you're doing a calculation and do not round too early. Also for the sciences, it's important to actually review the labs since we're in the middle of a pandemic. It is very likely that your child probably has not done very much in terms of lab work. So it's important that they actually review uh, websites that actually cover labs online or even watch YouTube versions of the labs so that they get an understanding of experimental design and how the labs actually work. Uh, AP exam for chem, pretty hard. 10.6% um, fives, 18.6% fours. Um, okay, so case studies. So one of my students, again, this one, this student actually I've worked with a lot. So a lot of different subjects. Also AP chemistry. His school also offered organic chem and that was definitely a very challenging course. Okay, so also in LA. Um, so that this would be the second year that I was working with him. And again, he got a five on his AP chem exam. 
And then last year, last year, this was very, very fun. So this was a high school student um, in the South Bay. He was taking CAM honors at his local high school, and he actually wanted to take the AP exam. Um, his instructor was like, well, there's a lot of topics we haven't actually covered in this class. So this is stuff that you're going to have to learn yourself. And then actually, then you would, you would theoretically be able to actually do it. And so basically, he worked really, really hard. Basically, I met with him two hours every week for, I think, a few months. And then basically, a lot of self-study, a lot of hard work, and he got a five on the, his AP exam. And then the last case study for AP chemistry was a student that was homeschooled. Very, very hardworking student, extremely well organized. Sometimes it was kind of scary how well organized he was. All of his schoolwork, he pretty much was in charge of everything. His mom was basically his quote unquote principal. And he basically just organized everything. He basically told his mom what he needed. And his mom would basically arrange for basically, for example, instructors to actually work with him. And so he took um, AP Chem. Yeah, he took AP Chem, a lot of self-study. It was actually pretty fun because I was actually doing the labs with him. So, and supervised him doing the labs and got a five on his AP chem exam. Okay, AP biology, AP biology. Again, very, very concept heavy class. It kind of follows, follows up after uh, basically bio, uh, bio honors or the high school biology class covering. Uh, and typically AP biology is usually taken after chem honors. And it kind of starts and starts at the end of what chemistry honors covers and then kind of goes off in a slightly different direction. So the chemistry of life, cell structure and functions, cellular energetics, cell communication, cell cycle. This is the cell communication and cells. Uh, well, the cell communication half is something that's definitely not covered in the regular high school biology classes. So definitely it's something that students definitely need to spend time reviewing to make sure that they fully understand it. In fact, one year's AP exam, I was kind of shocked that the one of the free response questions literally felt like something that ju they just literally pulled out of the textbook. It was just like amazing. It was a super straightforward question. It's like, if you had studied cell communication, it's like, bang, that was like one free question for the free response. Um, heredity, gene expression and regulation, natural selection, and also ecology. Okay, so I know for the sciences, I've probably said this a lot. It is really important to explain and justify as necessary. This is probably the biggest problem that I see with students, even for AP biology. Make sure to understand all the parts of the question, answer um, the question as specific as possible. Sometimes there are calculation type questions. And so those problems, make sure to show your entire thought process, just like I've um, explained already for the math AP exams. Um, I find that students for AP biology generally have more difficulty understanding and remembering the processes. So things like cellular respiration, photosynthesis, mitosis, meiosis, cell cycle, and also cell communication. These are all topics that students need to make sure that they review and make sure they fully understand. And again, just like for AP chemistry, it is important that students actually review the biology labs. There used to be a really good website that for um, biology labs online, but that website no longer is in existence now. And so that kind of blows. It would have been nice if that website was still around, make it a little bit easier for students to actually prepare by reviewing the labs. Now, biology score distribution, again, fives, it's pretty challenging, nine, nine and a half percent uh, fives, 22.7 percent fours. On top of that, I think this was like seven years ago, the number of fives for AP Bio was like 5%. That was like absolutely nuts. This is actually a student that's in Cupertino. So he was actually taking AP Bio and AP Chemistry the same year. Oftentimes, generally, it's not really recommended to double dip on the sciences, especially both at the AP level, because the classes are can be very demanding for the sciences. So for his AP Bio class, so he actually ended up getting fives on both of his AP exams. Now, his class final was a mock AP exam. Now, the funny thing is, is that his entire class, they took the exam, like almost everybody got like 100% on that mock AP exam. And so the instructor pretty much thought the students were cheating on the exam. And so he didn't count the final as part of their grade. And the students were kind of really mad about that because the students felt that the, um, the instructor's regular exams were much harder than actual AP. So that student, that student was, did find it kind of, kind, of, <laughs> kind of frustrating because he obviously could not include the final as part of his grade. Okay, uh, next up is AP Environmental Science. So AP Environmental Science covers maybe about a third AP Bio and the rest is other topics. So it includes a discussion of basically um, ecosystems and biodiversity, populations, earth system and resources, land and water use, 
um, energy resources and consumption, atmospheric pollution, aquatic and terrestrial pollution, and also global change. AP environmental science is typically considered a little bit on the easier side. So a lot of students do tend to pick it for um, their senior year science class after the challenges of surviving junior year. So then senior year is a little bit more relaxing. Now, like the other APs, it is important that students understand all parts of the question, making sure to answer the questions in a concise manner to make it easier for the graders to actually grade. Um, for calculation style type problems, make sure to show all the work and be organized in terms of answering the process uh, um, in answering the questions. So environmental science, fives are pretty hot. It's okay, a little, a little bit above the 10% mark. So 11.9% fives, 28.5% fours. Okay, now AP physics is actually covered by one of my colleagues, um, Howard, he, he actually will cover the AP physics. There are four different classes for AP physics. Now, some schools will not necessarily offer all of them. In fact, some schools basically uh, take AP Physics 1 and 2 and fuse them together as one class. Other schools will actually separate as two classes. So AP Physics 1 and 2 are algebra-based physics classes. So generally, it does not require concurrent enrollment or completion of AB or BC calculus, although some students will, take, will be taking that level of math when they actually are taking AP Physics. Now, AP Physics C is, the C basically means calculus-based physics. And that's going to be split into two exams. And each of those exams is going to be half as long, so an hour and a half each. So typically, a high school will actually, if they are doing AP Physics C, they will actually do um, basically both as one class. And so it'll be a full year course. So mechanics is one class, and then electricity and magnetism for uh, as a second exam. Generally, it is recommended that students are either concurrently enrolled or have completed AB or BC calculus. And the reason for this is because this is a calculus-based physics class, it is, can be very challenging trying to learn calculus at the same time as the physics. Because for the physics classes, if you don't understand how to do the math, it really hurts in trying to understand the concepts. And if you don't understand the concepts, well, it makes it really difficult to do the math. So at a minimum, you, the student does need to understand how derivatives and how integrals work in order to actually be successful at, at the AP Physics C level. Now, the four classes do cover similar topics. You can think of like AP Physics 1 and 2 together, basically covers kind of the same topics from an algebra perspective as AP Physics C. For AP Physics 1, there have been some changes this year for the AP exam. So it's going to cover kinematics, dynamics, circular motion and gravitation, energy, momentum, simple harmonic motion, torque and rotational motion, but they, they will not cover the electricity portion. So no electric charge or electrical forces, no DC current, uh, circuits and no mechanical waves or sound for the 2021 exam. Now AP Physics 2 basically covers uh, fluids, thermodynamics, electric force field and potential, electrical circuits, magnetism and electromagnetic induction, uh, geometric and physical optics, quantum atomic and nuclear physics. And then AP, uh, oops, this should be AP Physics C. AP Physics C, electro, electricity and magnetism will cover electrostatics, conductors, capacitors, dielectrics, electrical circuits, magnetic fields, and electromagnetism. And then uh, AP Physics C mechanics will cover kinematics, Newton's law of motion, work, energy, and power. So very similar to what was covered in AP Physics 1. Okay, now like the other science exams, it's important to review the physics labs. On top of that, it's very important to be careful in terms of doing your calculations and making sure to explain and justify as necessary. If you see the word justify or explain, it definitely means justify and explain. Do not uh, skip that portion of the question. Now, the score distribution for AP Physics, again, is it's kind of a little bit split, in part because AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2 are fairly new exams. It used to be called um, a AP Physics B, and then the College Board decided to split it into two, two separate courses. And the reason for that was simply because a lot of physics instructors felt like there was too much material to actually cover adequately as one class, so they split it. Um, so AP Physics C, again, the C, notice that the calculus-based courses have much higher percentage for fives, uh, similar to that of BC Calculus. Again, Usually the students that are taking AP Physics C are generally very strong in the math and science backgrounds. And so it's not very surprising to see such a high percentage of fives. History classes. The AP history classes are covered by my colleague, uh, Michael, Michael Skorsky. 
So uh, world history basically covers the history of the world, starting from about the uh, 1200s, running all the way up through the 1900s. Uh, actually, all the way up to the present. But because the AP history classes tend to be, uh, what is it? They tend to cover a lot of material. And so oftentimes, the material closer to the present usually is left to the students to study on their own. Typically, I find that for a lot of, of the history classes, they tend to get up to about the Cold War era-ish. And then after that, it's kind of like hard to actually finish the rest. So for the history classes, self-study is pretty much a requirement. Okay. Um, because the history classes do require significant amounts of essay writing, it is actually important that students uh, pre-write or kind of outline their thoughts before they actually start responding to the questions. That is, do not just, as soon as you finish reading the question, start writing a response, because then it makes it so that it's less organized and less coherent. It is important to consider the evidence that is presented and then think about how to incorporate it so it kind of explains your understanding of the material in a good way. Thesis statements, the bane of the English history, English history students. It's important to have a solid thesis, and this sometimes is probably the most challenging aspect, coming up with a thesis and being able to actually adequately support it. In addition, it is important that the prompt given in the question is actually adequately addressed. Score distribution for world history, 9.2% uh, fives. I suspect the reason why it's a little bit low is AP World is generally, in my experience, not offered very often as a class. So I suspect fewer students are actually taking AP World, unlike AP US or AP Euro. European history focuses exclusively on, you guessed it, Europe, covering um, basically from the Renaissance forward. Again, like world history, generally, generally, even though it's supposed to go all the way up to the present, oftentimes instructors do find it difficult to get through everything. And so they usually end at around the Cold War. Um, so like um, world history, right? Again, the thesis, super important, and also basically outline or pre-write so that you have a sense of what you want to include in your response. European history, a little bit better than world history, 13.7% fives, 20.1% fours. Okay, United States history. This class, when I took it in high school, God, this class was hard. Lots and lots of note taking. Um, so US history basically covers the uh, US, United States history starting from about 1491 all the way up to the present. Again, generally because there is so much history to go through, generally instructors will get up to about the Cold War. Um, again, just like the other history classes, very important to outline out the student, it's very important for the student to outline out their thoughts in terms of how they want to respond to the question. Consider the evidence and make sure you have a strong thesis statement. So for US history, score distribution about 13% fives. So closer to AP Euro in terms of distribution instead of AP uh, world history, 19.2% fours. Okay, AP government. So AP government is typically a one semester course, the one semester course rather than the full year. So this is gonna be covering the foundations of the American democracy, the interactions between the executive, legislative and judicial branches of government, civil liberties and civil rights, political ideologies and beliefs, and also political participation. Like the other history classes, again, it is important to consider the evidence, uh, have a strong thesis statement and making sure you uh, address the prompt that's given in the question. So government, a little bit higher in terms of distributions for fives. So 15.5% fives, 16.5% fours last year. AP English language and composition. So this is actually covered by my colleague, Nan. Again, the AP English classes are very, very, very demanding in terms of reading and writing. So if your child is not enthusiastic about reading and writing lots and lots of essays, AP Lang may not be their cup of tea. Okay, so distributions, not too bad. So, but again, note it is it is challenging to do well in AP Lang because of the sheer amount of writing. I remember one of my students complaining about having to rewrite like three or four essays for AP Lang simply because her instructor was really really intense, and she that her instructor pretty much demanded that you know you're going to have to rewrite a good chunk of your essays so that they are written better. So fives twelve point six percent, and then fours twenty point four percent. Let's see AP Computer Science. That's gonna be covered by my um, colleague, Anna. 
So um, it, typically AP computer science is usually Java-based. So, it, but it does not hurt to actually be familiar with other programming languages because a lot of the basic structures are still the same, or at least similar enough that it's not a hard transition. But officially, I believe College Board uh, recommends students learn Java for this. 25.6% um, fives, 21.7% fours for AP comp sign, which is pretty good. And then lastly, um, let's see, I think AP Spanish is covered by Jenny. Yeah, so foreign language class, again, basically cover, this is basically Spanish. Spanish from talking to my students usually is pretty, it's not too bad at the beginning, but it does get increasingly difficult to the point where if you're not a native speaker, it can be very challenging to do well in AP Spanish. Um, I would suspect part of the AP Spanish score being a little bit high in terms of fours and fives, probably because of the native speakers, just like for um, AP Chinese. So 30.5% fives, 36.4% fours. Okay, so how do we actually get a five on an AP exam? This is really, really hard, especially if your child is taking three or four APs in the same year, because that can sometimes be logistically difficult to actually plan, properly plan out a study schedule and review everything that they need to review for the exam. So one, okay, usually I start feeling a little bit on edge, like at the beginning of second semester for preparation for APs, but students generally don't start learning until about March, April, in part because typically content is not necessarily completely covered until, depending on the instructor, anywhere up through late March, early April. So now is actually a good time for students to actually start figuring out what do they need to review? What do they need to relearn? What are things that they still need to ask questions about? Prep books can be helpful to actually help review concepts and content. In addition, students should be utilizing the textbook and the class notes as a supplemental resource. I cannot tell you how often I have told a student off for not actually utilizing their textbook. The textbook is your best friend. It is a resource. Please use it. In terms of practicing for the AP exams, you can. Um, prep books do have a prep books do have practice exams. However, I find that prep book practice tests can vary greatly in terms of quality and actual similarity to the actual AP exams. So my preference is to actually practice with the released College Board exams, if at all possible. Now, it is crucial that students kind of learn the style and the type of questions that are usually asked on the exam. So running through some of the College Board exams is definitely helpful for that, especially for the free response. A lot of those uh, type of questions are actually on the College Board website, so definitely worth taking a look at. A lot of students are very passive in terms of how they learn. That is, okay, they read a book. They read the textbook. That is an example of a passive learning strategy. I generally recommend students do a more active style. So that means working through problems, engage their brain a little bit more, and they will actually be able to do better. Okay, and so we actually will be offering many AP review classes and also one-on-one -on -one tutoring. If you're interested in those services for your child, please contact my colleagues, um, Lindsay, and also I believe Ali will also be taking parent information regarding our classes. That's all for today. And uh, thank you for um, joining our webinar today. And thank you, Henry, for sharing all those uh, informations about the AP tab. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and we will see you uh, next Saturday at 8 p.m. If you have further questions, feel free to contact me. And um, Henry, you can show the last pair slides. Yeah. And if you're interested to join our WeChat group, feel free to scan my WeChat code on the screen or you can contact us through phone calls or emails to discuss your specific questions. Yeah, thank you everybody. We'll see you next week. Good night.